Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. As Pastor Jason mentioned, my name is Matthew Dudley. You can call me Matt. Uh, I am honored to be here with you today at Discovery. God is really doing something spectacular here, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to call Discovery friends. Uh, along with the church that I lead in Coachella Valley, down next to Palm Springs, uh, the spring, uh, I also have the honor of serving as one of the network youth directors for the Assemblies of God. And I have to say, you have some of the best youth pastors I've ever seen in Nick and Marissa. Um, I love them. They had an event here last night. 50 students gave their lives to Jesus. Come on. Yes. So even if my sermon is bad today, God did something great at Discovery this weekend. So why don't we dive right in? That'll be enough for introduction. Today, if there's one thought that I want to leave you with, one idea that I want to just resonate with you and bounce around in your heart and mind all week, it's simply this. It's that following Jesus requires transformation. Following Jesus requires transformation. You cannot follow Jesus and remain the same person that you were before you came to Jesus. Here's what I mean. If, if you are trying to follow Jesus today and you hold all of the same opinions that you held before you came to Jesus, and if you are trying to follow Jesus today and you still do all the things that you used to do before you began to follow Jesus, you're doing it wrong because following Jesus requires transformation. It requires that our lives begin to look different. And we're going to talk today about what that means. And we're going to talk about how we become people of transformation. And in order to do that, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about fish today. We're going to talk about a passage from Romans chapter 12 that I think is really important. And we're going to talk about what I would consider to be the real problem at play in the world today. And then I would like to get into what I consider the three biggest challenges of today's culture. So are you ready? I've got a lot to talk about, and I'm going to do it fast. So you have to listen fast. So here we go. Uh, I want to talk to you about fish. You know what fish are, right? Like fish are the, the swimmers. They're the ones with the gills and the fins and the scales, right? They're the ones that like every summer I go up to a lake in the Eastern Sierras with my dad and my brothers and we cast lines in the lake and we try to kill as many of them as we can that week. That's what fish are. They're the swimmers. They spend their entire lives in the water. Everything they do is in the water. They, they, they swim in the water. They breathe the water. They eat in the water. They, they have families in the water. They go to school in the water. See, I like that joke. Only like 3% of the room ever likes that joke. You are my people. Okay, so, so fish, they spend their entire lives in the water. You know what a fish never does? A fish never thinks about the water. It never does. It just lives in the water. It has its entire existence in the water, but it never once thinks about the water. You know when a fish begins to think about water, when a fish realizes that water is a thing? In the instant that it is plucked up out of the water and it, like for the first time, cannot breathe because it has been plucked from the water. That's when it realizes that it's been in the water. Following Jesus is very much the same way. We are all swimming in cultural waters, and until we begin to follow Jesus, we don't really realize it. In fact, the only way a fish is going to survive outside of the water is if a miracle of transformation happens and it somehow exchanges its gills for lungs. And it's the same for you. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to exchange the gills that help you to swim in the waters of culture and exchange them for lungs that will help you to breathe in the eternal life of God. You see, fish don't ever perceive the water until they're removed from it. They can only survive if they're really transformed. They don't ever perceive the water until they're removed from it. And we don't perceive culture until we're removed from it. We don't always see what's happening until we've been pulled aside. We don't always understand the world that we're living in until we are shown the world that we're living in. In the first century, the Apostle Paul, who was one of the first leaders of the Christian movement, he wrote a letter to a group of Christians in the city of Rome. Rome was far from Paul, and Paul had never met these Christians. And he writes this letter to them in order to encourage them, and, and in order to, to help them further their faith, and in order to help correct some issues even within their little burgeoning church. Paul writes to them, and as he writes to them, I can't help but think that he's writing to a group of Christians that would be a lot like us today. If there's, a, if there's a place in the ancient world that's like living in America today, it's, it's ancient Rome. It was the most prosperous place. The people that lived in Rome had more freedom than people in other places in the world. The people in Rome really had as much of the world was available in the first century at their fingertips. You know, they had indoor plumbing in Rome. I mean, it's impressive. It's impressive. In the first century, they had indoor plumbing. 
They were a very civilized people. And Paul writes to the Romans, and in Romans chapter 12, he's trying to help these Roman Christians see that they were a part of something, and now they're a part of something else. Today, let's look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It reads like this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You want to know God's will for you? It takes this. Give your whole bodies to God. Paul points out three things to the Romans that are easy for us to miss in this passage that I think would be very significant to the Romans. So first, let's talk about your bodies. Let's talk about your body. You see, Paul tells them that if they're going to worship God, they have to give their bodies to God. We like to live very compartmentalized, segmented lives. We like to think that we have our work life and our home life and our school life and our social life and our online life and our in-person life. We like to segment ourselves up as much as possible. In fact, I remember when I was in high school, I went to this small public charter school. There were maybe 400 students, junior high through high school. And, but just like any high school, it was filled with all sorts of like cliques, right? Like you, you go into high school and there's always the cliques. There's the, the jocks over here and the popular kids over here. And then there's, there's, there's you know, the guys Goth kids were like a big deal in the 90s when I was going to high school, probably because of the Matrix. Like there were, it was just kind of like what was going on in the world at that time. And, and listen, I'm a friendly guy. I like to avoid confrontation. And, and so I, I made friends with everybody. I, I, would, I would click hop is what I like to think of it as. And I'd hang out with this group over here and then I'd go hang out with this group over here and I'd hang out with this group over here. And in my mind, I thought, you know, this is really cool. I could just kind of fit into all these groups. I even had friends that hated each other in opposing groups, right? Like, I can't stand her. I can't stand her. I was friends with both of them. And, and, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. The reason I did that was because I thought it was, it was fine for me to chop up my life into segments. But that lacks integrity because integrity is being the same person in every situation, it's being one, singular. In fact, we get the word integrity from the Latin word integer, which is a single whole unit. You know, math class at, you know, the 945. Here we go. So a single integer, a single unit. That's what it is to have integrity, to be the same in every circumstance. When Paul writes to the Romans, he tells them, give your bodies to God. He's not just talking about a part of their lives. See, growing up in church, I, I had a pastor who, who told me, he said, you know, you're made up of spirit, soul, and body. And, and I don't think he was wrong. I think that my perception of what he was saying was wrong because I used to think of it as I have a spirit, I have a soul, and I have a body. I have these three parts of me, and the body is wicked and vile, and, and it's, it's everything that the world has to offer. And the spirit is from God, and it's everything that God has to offer. Here's the problem with that. That's not how Paul thought. It's not how the New Testament writers thought. They didn't think of our lives as being chopped up into three parts. In fact, it's inaccurate to say that you have a soul, you have a spirit, you have a body. What's accurate is to say you are a spirit, you are a soul, you are a body. In fact, the most accurate thing is to say you are a spirit, soul, body, to, to, to mesh it all together because that's what you are. You're a single whole unit. So when Paul says the way you worship God is to give him your whole body, what he's saying is everything that you are, every part of you, if you're going to follow Jesus, every single part of you has to belong to God. Your thoughts, your emotions, your will, everything. Your bodily experience, everything. What you do with your body matters because every single part of you matters. In eternity, your whole being will be redeemed. It's not just about your soul. It's about all that you are. Everything that you are should belong to God. The second thing that Paul talks about here is he, he tells them to not copy the behaviors and customs of this world. And when he talks about the world, he's using this word cosmos, Cosmos. Now, you might recognize this word because it looks a lot like our word cosmic, right? Like the word cosmos, it's like the word cosmic. And, and, and that's accurate because it's talking about all the things that make up the things. In fact, I like to say that the word cosmos literally means the stuff that gives all stuff its stuffness, okay? It's the stuff that gives all stuff its stuffness. In other words, the cosmos, when Paul's talking about this, he's not just talking about like this ethereal idea. He's talking about this palatable tension that you can feel. 
And I think that it's possible that in our day, more than any other time in recent history, we can feel the cosmos, can't we? We can feel the culture that we live in. We're like fish swimming in water, and we can feel the waters heating up. We can feel the tension rising. And if you're going to follow Jesus, it means that you've been plucked out of the cosmos, and you can no longer copy it. The cosmos is not aligned with Jesus. No matter how good it might sound, no matter how good it might feel or how familiar it might be, it's not aligned to Jesus. And that's what it is to follow Jesus. It's to bring your whole body, your whole being into alignment with him. The third thing that Paul points out here that we have to talk about is he says to be transformed in your mind, which is this Greek word metanoeo. Yes, Greek on Sunday morning. It's a fun day at church. He's talking about math and Greek. It's a great day. Here we go, metanoeo. Metanoeo is the word that gets used over and over again throughout the New Testament to refer to what we call repentance. Growing up in church, I was always taught that repentance was my life was traveling this way, and then I repented and I started traveling this way. And that's not a bad way to think of repentance. It's just not a complete way to think of repentance. Because the word metanoeo has less to do with my life was traveling this direction and I started traveling that direction, and it has everything to do with I used to think like this, and now I have chosen to think like this. I have chosen to think like this. This is important because we expect God to change everything about the way we think. But listen, you have to make a choice to begin to think in alignment with Jesus, to begin to think in alignment with God. You want to surrender your whole being to God? You want to come out of the cosmos of the world? It all starts here. Metanoeo, you have to change the way you think. Are you tracking with me today? Excellent. Today... If I were to sum up the cosmos in which we live, I would sum it up with one sentence, three words, one sentence to sum up the cosmos. You ready? Here it is. You do you. The waters that we swim in today, you do you. You do you. Whatever makes you feel good, whatever you feel is right, whatever you feel is the best thing, you just do that. Whatever's going to make you happiest, just do that. Can I just tell you right now, if everybody is living for their own happiness, at some point we're going to bring one another into conflict because at some point my happiness will infringe upon your happiness and your happiness will infringe upon mine. Because you are not a single unit from the rest of humanity. We are all connected. In relationship, in proximity, we're all connected. Your choice about whether or not you took a shower this morning impacts the people sitting directly around you in this building. (laughs) We are intricately connected. And if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to understand that the way of Jesus is a way of selfless abandon, where we surrender our lives and we begin to live like him and look like him, and it is not about me doing whatever makes me feel good. If your Christianity is all about being happy and all about Jesus making you joyful, you're doing it wrong. Because Jesus is called the man of sorrows. The way to follow him is to deny yourself, take up your cross, and die with him. I mean... That's what it is to follow Jesus. Is there joy in it? Absolutely. Should you be excited about it? Absolutely. But the cross is pain. The cross is pain, which brings me to what the real problem of the world is, the problem that that, that underlies everything. It's the struggle for authority or autonomy. The struggle for authority or autonomy. Now, we are Western American people, which means that we are all about autonomy, We like to be independent. We like being independent thinkers. We like to be on our own. We don't like anyone to tell us what to do. We even say crazy stuff like, uh, 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 you know, I am the king of my castle, which I guess you could because every house kind of has a throne. Um, But consider the kind of throne upon which you sit. (laughs) It's the struggle for authority versus autonomy. It's I always want to do what I want. I want to be autonomous. But that's not how we were created. In Genesis chapter 1 through 3, we get the story of God creating everything. God speaking the cosmos into existence, giving all the stuff its stuffness. And as he does that, he creates the first two humans, Adam and Eve. And he gives them an opportunity to choose to live in loving relationship with him. And instead, they choose rebellion because they believe a lie. 
They believed the lie that they could be completely autonomous from God. They believed that they could become like gods themselves, even though in a sense they already were. And they decide that autonomy away from God would be better than to live under the authority of God. Let me just point something out to you. Choosing to follow Jesus is choosing to live under authority. Following Jesus means living under authority. It's one of the things that makes Christians different from other religions. Other religions are all about self-fulfillment and self-empowerment and becoming enlightened, you know? And, and sometimes we treat our faith that way. I, I come to Jesus so that I can be more enlightened, and I, and I sprinkle in a little bit of Jesus throughout my week so that I can be more enlightened. But listen, 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 listen. This is Christian Buddhism, which is not Christianity. It's not following Jesus. Following Jesus is living under the authority of Jesus. It is abandoning your autonomy for the authority of the one true king. And all of the issues that we see in the world stem from this place. So let's talk about the culture in which we live. I see three large issues that we're facing. The first one I, I would call the erosion of truth. And I think the instant I say that, we already know what it is, right? The erosion of truth. Nobody seems to really know what truth is anymore. We've made truth subjective. We've made truth about whatever we want it to be. In fact, there's a popular saying, and maybe you've heard it or maybe you've said it before. Have you ever, you ever heard or maybe you've said, you know, just live your own truth? Anybody, anybody familiar with that one? Yeah, familiar with that one? Yeah, people say dumb crap all the time. <laughs> live your own truth is an absurdity. It's, it's a contradiction in terms. Because if truth is as subjective as whatever you make it out to be, it's not actually truth, it's an opinion. And listen, you might have good opinions. Your opinions might feel good. Your opinions might feel like something that you want everybody to understand. But let me tell you, it's just an opinion. It's just an opinion. So how do we know truth? Well, truth is everything that God says, and truth is everything that God has created. And if it doesn't align with what God says and what he's created, then it can't be true. And so when we are faced with an era that erodes away at truth, it leads into the second thing, which I would call the idolatry of ideology. A quick explanation on those terms. Idolatry is when we worship something other than God, right? Idolatry is, is the practice of worshiping an idol. And anything that takes the place of God in your life is an idol. And ideology, well, that's the stuff that we swim in today. That's where we're at. That's our cosmos. It's ideology. You know, America is a deeply religious place. It always has been. America was forged in religious expression. People came to the new world so that they could start a new nation, so that they could worship God freely. And that hasn't changed. While America might go to church less today than it ever has, it is no less religious than it's ever been. In fact, I believe that religious fervor is burning in our DNA. We've just traded the church house for the state house. We've traded the church house for the state house. And instead of worshiping at the altar of Jesus, we worship at the altar of political pundits. We worship at the altar of the party of our choice. We worship at the altar of a social justice movement. We worship at the altar of, 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 of libertarianism. We worship at the altar of, of all of these things because we're convinced that if we get the ideology right, then somehow we can organize the chaos of humanity into the utopia of heaven. But let me tell you with clarity and absolute truth today that we will never organize our way into the utopia of heaven. There is one God, one king. His name is Jesus, and there will not be peace on earth until he returns. <laughs> to follow Jesus is to choose an entirely different path. It's to choose to deny yourself and live for his pleasure and to serve others. To live for Jesus means that you are under his authority. As believers, we should be people well accustomed to surrendering to authority, not people that feel the need to subjugate with authority or reject and rebel against it. Instead, we should be the people most willing to embrace just authority. Friends, to follow Jesus is to abandon the ideologies that our world says will fix everything. Can I just point something out really quick? That ultimately the ideologies that divide us in America, they're just opinions about how to organize the government. We realize that, right? They're just opinions about how to organize the government. And as people of Jesus, that should be the least concern to us. 
because we should be more concerned about what God is doing right here, right now in Bakersfield. What God is doing right here, right now in your home. What God is doing right here, right now on your street. That's what should matter. That's what should matter. So let's stop worshiping at the altar of ideology and let's worship the one true king, Jesus. These two things, the erosion of truth and the idolatry of ideology lead us to what I would say is probably one of the largest challenges that faces the world today. It's, it's a really big issue. And it's what I like to call the postmodern sexual ethic. I want to take some time today to talk to you about this. From the context of Romans chapter 12, and from the context that everyone is fighting for autonomy against authority, and from the context that we have eroded away truth, and we worship our ideologies, we need to talk about this. So let me explain these terms, and then we're going to talk about them. I say postmodern because postmodern means past modern. In other words, it's past the modern age, past the age of modernity. So to be postmodern is to be after something. So what's the modern age? Well, the modern age came about really because of the printing press. It was the age of structure and organization when people began to systematize the world. That's what the modern age is. It is the age of systems and organization. And to be postmodern is to abandon those things. In fact, there are structures that they call postmodern structures, and they have stairways that lead to doors that go nowhere. And, 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 they, and they, they have doors that open to walls, and they, 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 they make no sense because there's no system or structure to them. We live in a postmodern age. In fact, a lot of times people like to say that we're beginning to experience persecution as Christians in America, and I think that's absurd. I do. I'm sorry. If you feel that way, I think it's absurd because I've traveled around the world, and I've met Christians that are actually going through persecution. I could take you to West Africa and introduce you to my friend Brent. He's a missionary there. And, and several years ago, Brent was driving a speed the light vehicle, a vehicle that was raised, like the monies were raised by youth groups in America to buy a four by four so that he could take the gospel all over West Africa. He was driving with a group of guys from one place to another through a, rem a remote area of West Africa. And as he was, another vehicle pulled up alongside of him and Al Qaeda agents leaned out of the doors with AK-47s and blasted the car, shot his kneecap off, took them out of the vehicle and left them for dead in the middle of nowhere just so they could steal their car. That's Christian persecution. Through a miracle, they survived the experience. I could, I could take you to Turkey and introduce you to a pastor there who's had his life threatened so many times because of preaching the gospel, so many attacks and attempts on his life that, 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 that the Turkish government has actually hired him a full-time bodyguard. Let's just let that sink in for a moment. The Turkish government hired him a bodyguard because he's preaching Jesus in a country that's 98% Islamic. They said, we got to protect this guy. That's persecution. I could, take you, I could take you to an abandoned schoolhouse in Athens, Greece, where over 200 Syrian refugees are living, and many of them have given their lives to Jesus. And, and if their families back in Syria and Iraq and all these places they came from found out they had become Christians, they would seek their death. To follow Jesus in some parts of the world literally costs you your body. So hear me. As we talk about what we're about to talk about, we are not an oppressed people. We are not a persecuted people, but we are a people entering an age that I would say is post-Christian. For years... American cultural values were informed by the Bible. They were at least informed by Judeo-Christian values. That day is gone. We don't live in that era anymore. And we might want to try and fight to bring it back, but it's okay. We should never expect those outside of the church to adopt the values of the church. We just can't. Because to be in the church means that you have chosen to live under the authority of Jesus. And anyone that hasn't chosen to live under his authority, we can't expect to live as though they were under the authority of Jesus. Are we, are we tracking together? 2 Corinthians 5 tells us plainly to not do that. It's the instruction of Paul. But we are living in an age that is increasingly post-Christian, which means that our values, as we follow Jesus, are going to increasingly divide us from the culture we live in. We were fish in the water 
and we have left the waters behind. Understand, you can't follow Jesus and keep going swimming. You can't follow Jesus and keep going swimming. In fact, what he calls us to do is go fishing. Doesn't tell us to get in the water. Tells us to pull him up out of it. You're tracking with me today. So the postmodern sexual ethic. How does the world think about sex? Well, the cosmos that we live in is you do you, which is all about your pleasure, your gratification, your joy. Can I just tell you, sex is much more than that. Some people like to say that the biblical view of sex is this old repressed view. And people that say that have no idea what they're talking about. Honestly, I, I say that with respect, but to say that is to take an intellectually lazy approach to the Bible. Because the Bible actually doesn't teach a repressed view of sexuality. It elevates sex as sacred and treats it as holy. Whereas the world treats sex as you do you. It's about whatever makes you happy, whatever satisfies you, and it has nothing to do with your partner. It's all about your satisfaction. People will abandon their marriages because they're unsatisfied in their sexual lives. People will practice all kinds of bizarre sexual activity because they're unsatisfied with their sexual lives and they are looking for pleasure. The Bible elevates the view of sex. Now, some people try to say, well, the Bible doesn't really understand the way that we think about sexuality today because today we think about sexuality as like, you know, there's, there's all these gender identities and there are sexual identities and they just didn't have those in the first century, to which I say, again, intellectually lazy because Greek and Latin, the languages spoken in the first century, have close to 30 different words for different types of orientations. In fact, the Roman culture that Paul wrote Romans chapter 12 to was steeped in a sexual ethic that was so bizarre that by today's standards, we would say, they're crazy. I, I mean it. There were things they were doing that today we would say are reprehensible and abusive, and they called them orientations. So to say that the Bible doesn't know how to speak to these things is ludicrous. And to say that the Bible somehow treats sex and sexuality as, as this repressive sort of thing, again, ludicrous. What the Bible actually does is teach us something that the rest of the world won't tell you about sex. See, I drive a 2014 Kia Soul, um, which I know, you're really impressed. I'm basically a prosperity preacher. Uh, <laughs> I drive a 2014 Kia Soul. And I love my car. I, this is not a gripe on my car, but I, I recognize that, like, I'm in Bakersfield right now, and in the parking lot, there's probably at least 10 lifted trucks, right? And, and so, so I drive this little 2014 Kia Soul, and I drove in here last night, and I, I was coming up from Southern California, and I'm coming up over the grapevine, right? And I'm coming up the mountain, and, and my little engine is just, right? It's doing everything in its power to come up the elevation. Like, all the gerbils are running as fast as they possibly can. <laughs> Pretty sure one of them passed out. Like, it, it, it's a thing. It's a thing. But my little 2014 Kia Soul, my little 2014 Kia Soul is still powerful. Like, say I'm driving down the road, and I don't like the traffic. So I, I make this choice. I make this choice. I, I take my Kia Soul, and I, I jump the curb, and I start to drive down the sidewalk because I fit on the sidewalk. It's just a Kia Soul. <laughs> so I jump the curb, and I, and I get onto the sidewalk, and I start to cruise down the sidewalk. And as I do that, as I do that, I, I'm just going slow. I'm doing like five miles per hour. You know, I can do damage at five miles per hour. I could, I could, I could bang up my car. I could, I could bump into people and hurt them. I could knock over, you know, trash cans and things like that. I could do property damage. If I started doing like 40 down the sidewalk, I could kill people. Because anytime you take something out of its context, it ceases being productive and starts to become destructive. And the Bible teaches us a clear context for human sexuality. It does. It does. It gives us lanes. And the reason it gives us lanes is not because God is trying to withhold anything from anyone. It's because the Bible teaches us something that the world will never teach us. Sex is powerful. It's powerful. Sex is powerful. No one's saying it's bad. But most people will not tell you the honest truth that it's powerful. And the truth that we have to come to grips with today is that in a postmodern sexual ethic, we ignore the power of sex for the pleasure of it and find ourselves always wanting more. 
I pastor in Coachella Valley, like right next to Palm Springs. We're in Desert Hot Springs in Cathedral City. If you ever come down to play golf, come see us. But we're right next to Palm Springs. And, and some people don't know this about Palm Springs. If you've never been there, Palm Springs is a small city. It's like 40,000 people. And Palm Springs is number two per capita only to San Francisco. So the percentage of openly LGBTQ plus people is number two only to San Francisco in Palm Springs. It's a very large, vocal, organized community, and I love them. I adore them. Honestly, it's the reason that I feel like God has put me there, because he has broken my heart for this community. Now, this, is, this is going live online right now, so I won't name names, but the reason I can talk about this today is because I know people in my church who I love and I pray with and I counsel with who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. I adore them. But I also recognize that to follow Jesus is to live under authority. It means to live a different kind of life. The Bible teaches us a single context for human sexuality. It's one man and one woman in the context of heterosexual marriage. Period. That's it. That's it. All sexual activity outside of that falls into the category of what the Bible would call sexual sin. And people that look at me and say, well, where does the Bible actually say that? It says it a ton of times. It's just that we've forgotten what words like, 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 like promiscuity mean. And we've forgotten what words like adultery actually mean. And we've forgotten what, 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 what these terms actually refer to. They refer to sexual activity outside of the context of marriage between a man and a woman. That means... That for the gentleman that, that watches porn on his cell phone on Sunday morning before he goes to church, he's in sexual sin. And that means that for the woman that's having an emotional affair with her boss, she's in sexual sin. And, and it means that, that, that any one of us that is practicing a form of sexuality, sexuality outside of that context, that we are living in sin. And guess what? The good news for all of us today is that Jesus died for sinners. For us, for all of us. And listen, people don't like to hear that they're sinners, but, but they forget that we all are. We're all a mess. See, the call to follow Jesus is the call to live under authority. And there are parts of his authority that are going to be more difficult for certain individuals than others. And then these parts over here are going to be more difficult for them. And so the call to a sexual uh, 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 purity, as the scriptures would call us to, may be harder for some than it is for others. We have to recognize that difficulty and with compassion, help brothers and sisters walk through it. Because to follow Jesus is to live under authority. It's to live under authority. You know, there's this amazing thing that's happened in the last several years. We, we've moved from dealing with issues of sexual orientation and sexual identity into issues of gender orientation and gender identity. That's become the big loud voice in culture. Can I just tell you, up until about six years ago, it was roughly six years ago, the vast majority of individuals that would have been diagnosed as gender dysphoric, which is the, the actual clinical diagnosis for somebody that would be transgender, the vast majority, we're talking well over 90% of individuals that were diagnosed as gender dysphoric were boys under the age of five an actual clinical diagnosis, boys under the age of five, up until about six years ago. Now we hear nothing about the numbers of actual clinical diagnoses. Instead, we hear the numbers of those who are coming out as transgender. You know who the largest group is now that comes out as transgender? Not diagnosed, but comes out? It's girls in the age of junior high years. That's the, that's the largest group that does now. So what happened? Because if I, if I look at the data, it doesn't make sense. The only thing that makes sense is the waters changed. The cosmos changed. The narrative changed. Because see, what we forget is that your adolescence is an age during which you are discovering your identity. Adolescence is all about trying on identities. That's why you'll have a kid that, that, that one week he looks like a punk rock kid, right? And then the next week he's all preppy because he's trying to figure out who he is. And that's okay. Adolescence is about figuring out who you're going to be as an adult. 
But let's just stop for a moment and recognize that sex is powerful. And when we expose our young people to something that is more powerful than they are emotionally prepared for, it causes a lot of confusion. It causes a lot of confusion. I say this with all compassion and love in my heart. Please hear me, please hear me, please hear me. My heart beats for this community. It does. Because I recognize, though I have not experienced, I recognize that a pain and a confusion in your identity is something that rocks you to your core. It is not an easy path to be on. It's a path marked with difficulty and questions. And, 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 and honestly, honestly, it's one that no one should walk alone. But let's embrace truth instead of ideology. Several years ago, I had a young lady in my youth ministry. Her, her name, well, I'll just call her D, because I don't want to say her name publicly, because I want to respect her. I remember D came into my office. D's dad was never really in the picture, and, and I just, I adored this girl. I mean, honestly, she, like, became a daughter to us. She's a sweet kid, and, I mean, brilliant. I mean, 12 years old, you should have read this girl's writing. I mean, just brilliant mind. And she comes into my office one day. She wants to meet with me. She says, Pastor Matt, I need to talk to you. I said, what's up? She says, well, I'm pretty sure I'm experiencing adolescent depression. And she starts naming off like three or four different clinical diagnoses. And I stopped her. I stopped her. I said, wait, 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 D, hold on. Have you been to a doctor? Have you been to a therapist? And she said, no. <laughs> I said, you've been reading a lot of articles on the internet, haven't you? And she said, yes. I said, rule number one, we don't self-diagnose. Even a doctor won't self-diagnose. That's just not healthy. It's not good practice. We're not objective about those things. So don't self-diagnose. Stop right there. I said, number two, D, you're 12 years old. You're 12 years old. And she looked at me. She said, Pastor, I'm pretty sure I'm bisexual. I said, D, you're 12 years old. You're 12 years old. All secular science would tell you that during your adolescence, that's when your sexual identity is formed. That's what secular science would say. I said, so D, at 12, at the beginning of your adolescence, let's, let's pause, let's pause, and let's say, surrender your sexuality to Jesus. Some time goes by. D was Hispanic, is Hispanic, and, and um, she's going to turn 15. And so they want to do a quinceanera. And they want me to do the, the I'm going to say quince because I butcher that word. And so, so I'm going to do the quince for her. And she comes in to meet with me, her and her mom. And this is when it happens. Sweet, precious D comes out to me. She looks at me. She says, Pastor Matt, I've been seeing a therapist. I'm gender dysphoric. I'm transgender. I hate myself. I look in the mirror and it makes me want to vomit. I have physical response to what I see in the mirror. And she began to just vent for half an hour or more, just tears and snot and, and, and just all of it coming out. And my heart broke because I love that kid. She's going through pain. She's going through confusion. She's 15 and she's, she's wrestling through an issue that I barely understand. So I listened. I looked at her, I said, Dee, let me point something out to you. Because she starts telling me, like, I, I don't feel like I can come to church because everybody's going to judge me. I, I don't feel like I can do this. I, I feel like everybody's going to be looking at me. I said, Dee, stop. As long as I'm here, there's a seat for you here. That's number one. I said, number two, as long as Jesus is here, there's always a spot for you. Because all he's ever wanted is to be with you. The challenge is that we have thought that we can only surrender a portion of our lives to Jesus. And Paul tells us that we have to give our whole bodies to God. But D, you just have to be with him. You have to be with him. And that's what he wants from you. He wants to be with you. And with tears running down her face, I looked at her and said, D, do you want, do you want that? Do you want to be with Jesus? Do you want Jesus to walk through this with you instead of trying to figure it out on your own? And she just said, yes. And I walked over, I knelt down beside her, I put an arm around her shoulder, and we began to pray. 
the presence of God fill that room. Her mom is a puddle. I mean, she's just crying her eyes out. I'm telling you, I love this kid like she was my own. And I never do this. I never do this. But, but there was just this compassion in me. And after we prayed, you know, she's just this little tiny thing. I just kissed her on top of the head like a dad would. And I said, Dee, I love you. I love you. And Jesus loves you more than I ever could. Can I encourage you today that your entire identity needs to be wrapped up in who Jesus is and what he says about you. There's a lot that could be said about sexual identity. There's a lot that could be said about gender identity. And we're not going to solve any of it today. But you know what we can do? We can come to Jesus. We can offer our whole bodies to God. We can allow him to transform us so that we no longer look like the cosmos in which we swim and instead we can live lives that are surrendered to Jesus. Why don't we take a moment and pray together? Holy Spirit, in this moment, I trust you. I trust you to remove any confusion. I trust you to remove any pain of rejection. Holy Spirit, in this moment, I trust you to do what only you can do. Today, maybe you're here. And, and, and for you, the, the, the wrestle isn't so much about your sexual identity or your gender identity, but it's just you in general. Or maybe it is those things. The question I have for you to do to, to today is, is, is nothing to do with your sexual identity. It has to do with, are you trying to live in your own autonomy? Or are you trying to live under the authority of Jesus? Today, I want to invite you to live under the authority of Jesus because it is where life truly resides. You want to live the the life that God created you for? It lives there under the authority of Jesus. If you're here today, and today is your day, today is the day that you need to surrender to Jesus. Maybe you've been checking church out a little bit, and and, and you've been thinking about it, and they're talking about baptism services next Sunday. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time. You're you're coming out of the waters. You're not a fish anymore. It is time for you to exchange your gills for lungs. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, if that's you, I want you to slip up your hand, and we're going to pray together that Jesus would enter your life, and you would be surrendered to him, that he would be the authority, and you would surrender your autonomy. So on three, if If that's you, slip up your hand and keep it up, and I want to pray with you. One, two, three. Go ahead. Put those hands up and keep them up. Yeah, I'm surrendering to Jesus today. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hands are going up around the room. Go ahead. Go ahead. Take a moment. Take a moment. I really believe someone's wrestling with this right now. In fact, I believe right now someone in here is saying, you know, it's just another church where they're preaching against my sexuality. No, we're not preaching against you. We're preaching for you. Because I have a Savior who welcomes you to his cross, who welcomes you into eternal life, a Savior who welcomes you into transformation. And if today you'll take a chance on him, he will transform you. If that's you, slip up your hand and hold it up high and be bold and be ready to surrender. I want to invite you all to pray a simple prayer with me. One sentence. One sentence where we're going to begin the conversation with God. And this isn't everything you and God are going to need to talk about, but but it's where it all starts. It's where we begin our surrender. Pray like this. Pray with me. Jesus, go ahead. Everybody in the room, pray it like you mean it. Jesus, I give you my life. That's where it begins. It's that simple. And now live it. Father, thank you for what you're doing here today. Thank you for what you're doing in us.